Hello everyone, in case you don't know, if you had like someone wrote the, I don't know, like uh, uh, place if you don't know where you are, this is the Bitcoinology Meetup. Uh, you can find us on Twitter on Meetup, on even Bright and everywhere else, make sure to follow. And today we have Igor, uh, the guy who created Blue Wallet, to talk about some really cool lighting developments he likes, you know. So here it is, Igor. Yeah. Hi guys, thank you for coming. My name is Igor. Uh, yeah, so we're doing this talk as a warm-up before Advancing Bitcoin is going to be in London soon. I'm going to have a different talk in London uh, in Advancing Bitcoin. So we decided to give a different talk today here. Uh, so I thought I could compose a list of cool stuff that's happening in Bitcoin and Lightning development. Uh, we, we could just go through this list, dissect it, see how it works. Um, so also, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not an expert on this list particular. So I was thinking maybe you guys could correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm saying something stupid, please say that I'm saying something stupid. Uh, if you can add something, please interrupt me and say that you can add this or this. Uh, so as a warm up, let's first go through the list of technologies that people think can scale blockchains. So I counted seven. How many guys you can name? Just anyone. What can we do to put more transactions in block, in blockchains, more per second, better throw output. What can you do? Lightning. <laughs> lightning, what's exactly lightning? Just doing something, someone else is selling on chain. I think it's Chinese. Payment channels, correct. Right. What else? Side chains. What? What, what? Side chains. Side chains, perfect. Like liquid. What else? Batching. Rollups. Yeah, but you could add batching as a sidechain, right? So, so you could say that rollups, which is a big thing in Ethereum, is a... What I was saying? So, uh, the big thing in Ethereum is rollups. Optimistic and uh, um, ZK, zero knowledge, right? But they're essentially uh, batching into a sidechain, right? Well, yes. Bitcoin is talking about batching multiple payments on chain. He's talking about, right? Yeah. yeah. Like when the exchange sends out all of its customers at once instead of individual transactions. Okay. Okay. But that's still one transaction, right? Well, okay. Let's let's go. Let's next. What's next? What can we do to increase throughput? Reducing the actual data bridge. What? Taking some of the excess information out that isn't necessary. Like compress the data. Okay. Good idea. What else? Bigger blocks. Bigger blocks, yes. What else? What else related to blocks we can do to increase transactions? Count. State chains. Space chains. Okay. <laughs> extension blocks. That's a good one. Which is like somewhere between. What's extension block? Well, it's somewhere between the side chain and like on chain. It's where you miners commit to another block outside the block that's like optional to take part in. Yeah, just think of it as like a quasi side chain. People talk about it a lot because it's really mm -hmm. like that. Drive chains. Drive chains. Whatever they do with minimal chains, no idea what they do. They do something magic. What? 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 So again? Whatever they do with minimal one. Minimal one. Nothing. Yeah. I have no idea what's minimal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and state chains. I was looking into state chains. I think it's just a multi-sig with a state chain MTC, right? So you have two out of three multi-sig with your counterparty, uh, with the state chain entity, and then you just exchange uh, private keys, uh, and the state chain entity. Uh, just makes sure that everything's correct, right? This this transaction, yeah. This this funds being moved from party to party without a big transaction. And so the previous okay. party can't. Okay. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah, I think we counted more than seven. <coughs> I forgot about a couple of them. What about signature aggregation techniques, which would allow for much higher throughput of like a very large transaction with hundreds of people transacting. Like, like Schnorr transactions, like a tap room. Yeah, but with the, the concept is cross input uh, signature aggregation and then later maybe cross block signature aggregation. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a good find. Yeah, but we mentioned we, we could do uh, just some kind of uh, transaction optimization or compression. Yeah. I guess that falls into this category. Okay, cool. So, yeah, that's a good warm up. Thank you, guys. So, let's start with uh, one thing I found interesting. This unrelated to this list to this uh, techniques. So Synonym. The Synonym is a company that John Carvalho started and he's trying to put Web3 inside of uh, Bitcoin infrastructure. 
So he, like users should claim back their privacy, their own data, blah, blah, blah. But what it consists of? So they're using um, several things like identities and people hosting their own data. So with identity, I want to start with... So... Yeah, so the first thing I want to mention is address ownership uh, proof protocol. This is the thing that we added in Blue Wallet like some months ago. So it was actually, as I think it was a Switzerland exchange that wanted this, so they had sent us a pull request and we merged it. So basically, the Switzerland exchange, for compliance reasons, wants to be able to send out funds only to the addresses users want to prove they own. And the way they do it is they sign, sign arbitrary message with this private key that's associated with, the, uh, with an address. And this is how they prove that uh, they own the address. So the way it works is that a uh, user scans the QR with, with his mobile wallet, he scans the QR on the web, on Switzerland Exchange website, and this QR code says, this is the arbitrary data, please sign it with your private key and post the result to this uh, API endpoint. So that's what Wallet does, Access also, uh, of course it asks you if, if you want to do it, if you want to proceed, this is what you're doing, uh, do you agree with it? If you say yes, 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 in the end you sign some uh, random data with your private key and you post it to the API endpoint. This is how you prove that you own the address. <clears throat> and one of the ideas of the Web3 is that users can carry their identities with them and always prove that they are who they are. Of course we know how PGP works, but how can we put it in a, in a Bitcoin? And this is how you do it. But, but, not, but not this. This is just a very specific thing for like some Switzerland exchange. But the general idea is that you sign some message, you prove your own address, and this is going to be your identity which you carry with you across, I don't know, some websites, some forums, some blogs. Um, and since we've got HD wallets, which carry a lot of addresses, we can issue new identity for each uh, for each website we visit. I guess it works a little bit differently in Synonym, but the idea is still the same. There, well, there is no way around to around. There is no way around this. You still have to sign something uh, with your private keys, with your Bitcoin private keys. You've got the uh, hierarchical hierarchy. Determine it. Yes. How do you how do you pronounce it? Yeah, so you, you've got the HD wallets, you've got lots of addresses, you've got a lot of identities. This is how you do it. Now, you own the address, you proved your identity, uh, and you want to share your data with some peeps on the interwebs, uh, with some blogs, forums, I don't know. So how do you do it without uh, giving up your privacy or self-hosting your data? We know for a fact that people don't want to run servers, so we try that. People just don't do it, like not the majority of them. Uh, so, uh, the synonym took the pretty cool thing which is called Hypercore. So the Hypercore is a protocol, I like to think about it as the uh, personal torrents which are friendly for developers. So the Hypercore is basically a append-only binary log uh, which involves Merkle trees. Uh, so the one who started the Hypercore uh, can always prove that this is the data he wrote and no one can alter it because it's authenticated by some private key. So this is we see the connection of opening private keys with Hypercore. So I as a user can probably prove that I own this address and I can start a Hypercore uh, with the data I own and sync it to other parties. So Hypercore is very effective, perfect, very efficient. Uh, so, uh, basically it acts as a torrent, so you can share it to multiple parties uh, and it gets synced um, very fast and efficient. In fact, one of the cool demos I saw for Hypercore is that some guy started a video streaming through Hypercore and shared it to his people, uh, to his peeps. But basically video streaming is, is a stream of bytes. So you can share this binary log uh, to other people and they, they catch up pretty fast, they read it. They, ca they catch up to the top and they're synced. So you can watch the video from real time. Uh, that was video. Uh, so why not put my personal data in Hypercore? With Hypercore you have the ability uh, to not just share data, you can uh, add some more custom rules like this, this specific shard or whatever is gonna be 
uh, writable by someone else, authenticated by, by this public key. So this turns a tree-like structure, which is involves cryptography, uh, which no one can alter uh, except me or who, whoever I uh, approved. And this is how I'm going to share my data. I'm sorry, just a couple of things. Like one, if there is data involved, right? You said it's like a torrent. So is yeah. there like some peer-to-peer? -peer yes, absolutely. So it's peer-to-peer. Uh, of course, there is no magic. So, so there are um, so there are ex exchange of peers involved. So once you start the hypercore, if you're running hypercore by yourself, uh, you need a, a central entity which where, where peers gonna register. But this, yeah, this, this is basically a torrent. And are people being incentivized to hop, to, to be those peer to peer servers in a way? This, this so like, I mean, presumably you said before the problem was you had. Um, various people trying to put up a server of their own, they weren't keeping it there, right? Mm. So presumably you would be holding on to a batch of a load of different people's data. No, no, not you. So you're holding your own data because you're seeding your hypercore. So as a user, it, it could be even transparent to you. You're not even, you don't even know that you're hosting hypercore for your own data and you're seeding it to other peers and other, all peers who want to check out your data, see your blog posts, they just discover you and they stream from you. So it's not just your own address, it will be on a device that you have as well then, right? Say again? Because there's still data involved, right? On top, outside of the address. What we've done is we've done you confirm the address with the email, yeah, yeah. it, and then there's data which is all your information, right? Where is that held? Um, you go to some website, you see other people, and you want to check them out, and you connect to them. So the site has your information? Mm -hmm. Yes, but not your information, though only the information that you authenticated by your public key has this information. So it's like a gate, it's like a, a fork on a road and you see a sign. And this sign says, if you go there, you'll get this. So where's the source of the information then? Where, where do you put your, like if you're sharing half your data with that particular site, where is it the original data comes from? On, on, your, on your own host. Your, your host, yes, you, you have to see this. So. Uh, no one's going to host it for you. You're seeding it yourself. But uh, if many peers connect, it's a P2P. So, P2P. so it's P2P. So when many people join, they can stream from other people, not just from you. But because it's a Merkle tree, it's provable that the no data was altered when the, it was delivered to other people. So, they, so the P2P peers can, can verify that it's unaltered and it comes from you originally. So would you need to be online the whole time? Uh, for the initial for the initial seed, once you seeded it, you're good. Like, well, maybe maybe no one cares about you. You don't have any peers, and when you, when you're offline, you cannot seed it, right? But if you have a network of friends, they can seed to 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 each other your data when you're not around. Maybe reputation. Maybe reputation. Yes. Yeah, so so the synonym. This is how I understood synonym. This is what John works on. Uh, if I got it correctly. Yeah, there should be reputation involved somewhere here. I don't know where exactly, but somewhere here. Um, yeah, so this is Hypercore. Hypercore is a pretty cool thing because it, it's, it's, it wasn't made for synonym or by synonym. It's a it's pretty old product, so you can go and check it out. It's, it's basically a, a, a torrent friendly for developers. If you need some kind of a sync of, bi of binary logs, to, on, on your host or something, you can try it out and maybe it will work for your own application. So just go and check it out with Hypercore. It's pretty cool. I tried it. What else? Um, so, and uh, Synonym as a company, it's a Tether company, Tether owned company. And man, I love Tether. Tether is a, is a stable coin, the biggest one. Uh, if we could have one shit coin, one shit token, it could be on the Tether and we don't need anything else. So, and yeah, it's funny that people are always concerned that Tether is going to fall once people will find out that there is no backing of this Tether. But who cares, you know, like, dollar is not ba isn't backed by anything, like, British pound isn't backed by anything, like, who cares? Like, we know this and we still use dollars. So, I, I think Tether will live a long and happy life. Uh, so, what this means is that uh, Tether originally runs on Omni Protocol. By the way, you, you don't have to clean, you don't have to clear each one, you can just make it start a new page at the bottom. Oh, okay. So, Tether runs on Omni Protocol. 
Didn't they go to the ER when they moved, didn't they? Yeah, they're on the ELC, but they're also trolls. Yeah, that's that's another cool thing about Tether is that I think about Tether as a as a, as a meta coin. You know, they adapt, they survive, they change. Like you know, if 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 Ethereum dies, they don't care. They they can run on Solana. If Solana dies, they don't care. They can run on whatever some yeah liquid whatever. If liquid dies, they can run on what what. Yes, Tron, exactly. So a bunch of shit coins, they can run on all of them, and they don't care. But they, they keep their hand on the pulse, so they can check it out. If, if it's dying, we'll just migrate. But still, they run on an omni, uh, omni layer. Um, and that's the original protocol for issuing tokens on Bitcoin blockchain. So the way it works is that someone uh, puts a transaction on Bitcoin blockchain and puts the op return op code with with some data so the prefix is on so the they create an output op return with prefix omni and the rest is data and this data is usually very basic operations like issue token with this uh, id uh, move this token if i own it um, what else multi-sig uh, Batch send, they, they support batch send for airdrops. So very, it's not an UTXO, it's a kind of an account based. So the specialized software, which they call uh, OmniDemon, uh, can parse the whole Bitcoin blockchain and uh, check out all those op returns with the prefix Omni uh, and uh, create kind of like accounts map for everyone who issued something, who moved something and basically keep track of all the Omni tokens. Uh, that were created and moved and who owns how much. And USDT, the Tether, the USDT, is, is, the, is one of the tokens on Omni protocol. So this works on a Bitcoin blockchain. So every time you're making a transfer, you're creating a Bitcoin transaction. And you can move your USDT or other tokens if you want to create. How do we put it on Lightning? That's, the, that's, that's a good question, right? So the way they put it on Lightning is that uh, they have a multi-seek uh, in one of those. Om this is going to be some instruction, this is like some data. So they have a multi-seek uh, on Omni and they create a state channel with this multi-seek on Omni. So they create another Bitcoin transaction where one of the outputs is going to be a funding transaction for, for regular Lightning channel. Of course, it's not a regular Lightning transaction because uh, it involves uh, locking some Omni uh, tethers, some USDT. Does it make sense? So this is just going to be a normal channel open, but it's just going to have the Omni return for the thing. Yeah, yeah, but it, but the channel open is not going to be recognized by regular LMD uh, because they they had to take the bolt and 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 uh, the specification and they called it lightning not lightning bolt. How did they call it? Omni bolt, right? So they took the specification of regular lightning channels, they alter it a little bit so it suits working with this uh, op return outputs where everything happens actually is not inside the uh, Bitcoin script, everything happens inside of Omni multi-sig. They called it Omnibolt. And uh, so regular LND cannot work with this. And they put the collateral for it. What? You said they put the funds up. Yeah, you have to have yeah, you have to have collateral. So you need to have USDT first to lock it in the channel. So uh, kind of like regular Bitcoin when you create Lightning channels. So you take your USDT, you create a channel, you, you with some counterparty, you, you fund the channel with your USDT. Of course, there is another uh, output for regular BTC, which is because you cannot fund um, uh, redemption or punishment transactions with USDT on Bitcoin blockchain. You have to have a little bit of BTC, regular BTC for closed channel transactions. Yeah, that because there's nothing lacking on Tether. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, when someone created Tether, he just created op return on Bitcoin blockchain, but he said, with this prefix only, I'm issuing asset with an ID Tether, USDT, and I'm issuing myself like, a lot of tethers, like I own it. So this is how tether was, was created. It's not on Bitcoin blockchain. It's not backed, so you cannot redeem your um, USDT on Bitcoin. 
Well, I, technically you can, because inside of this Omnia specification, there are opcodes for uh, doing trades for DEX. So OmniLayer actually was a, a motherland of original DEX. So you could put up offers to sell some kind of your, some, some of your Omni tokens through Bitcoin and other people would pick them up from Bitcoin blockchain and do some trades. Well, people, I don't think people use that much these days. I don't know. I haven't checked it out. So, can I ask, so does that mean that there'll be a bunch of anyone who wants to use the only layer, they'll each have to have not LND but another implementation? Yes, yes. So, they, they, they created uh, uh, they created another software. I think it's called Omnibolt uh, Demon. Yeah, so you have to run Omnibol Daemon to fund your transactions with Tether. And after that, it acts pretty much as regular Lightning channels. And we're all aware of how Lightning channels work, right? We're specialists in them. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, another cool thing is that they specifically designed the Omnibol Daemon with the fact that signing keys are not going to be residing on this daemon. So people, actually, light clients can connect to one omnibold demon, each keeps his own seat, and signing happens on the client only, and this acts some of like some kind of relay, something like that. I don't know how it works, but they but they claim they did it. Yeah. Well, unlike L and D, because in L and D it's very hard to extract signing part from the rest of the demon. That's why people have to. Uh, carry with them their whole L and D to when they want to do lightning stuff. So even mobile clients like like Breeze Wallet, it's uh, essentially whole L and D packaged as packaged as a mobile app. Can't Macro Rings help with that then? Uh, thing because you can you can delegate specific like, Yeah, but it, technically you can, but I I don't think they finished the support of this in L and D. So it was an idea years back. But still, no one uses it. So the idea was that you can issue macaroons like and authenticate yeah, someone. Can I admin macaroon everything? Mostly, yeah, mostly. So, no, sometimes there are macaroons to create invoice. Like there are services where you can issue read-only macaroons to so someone can issue invoice, but you cannot lose money in this way, right? You can only authenticate someone to create invoices on your behalf, and you will receive money. But issuing macaroons like I allow this guy to withdraw. 10,000 set. Maybe it's supported technically, but no one uses it. Yeah. So we have, uh, now we have USDT on Lightning. This is the plan for Synonym. Any questions? Maybe someone can add something. Maybe I missed something. I'm, I'm not sure. I know it's the identities. That's all I heard of. What's Synonym? So Synonym is everything. All, all of that, like, uh, Having your identity, having your data, and having your uh, tokens on Lightning as a single package. So uh, what John wants, he wants to reinvent, not reinvent, he wants to take Web3 and make it Bitcoin friendly. Because, you know, Web3 is a term for shitcoiners, right? They always say Web3, Web3, what's Web3? This is Web3, but now we're trying to put it inside uh, blockchain. Uh, so, sorry, Bitcoin ecosystem. I guess the question is, what is Web two actually? To be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my, so yeah, that was my. I was going to say that <laughs> that's my finishing remark. Like, I'm not a big fan of Web three, because I'm not a big fan of Web two. Like, you know, we we were supposed to have flying cars and colonies on Mars, and instead we have tribunes for idiots. You know, like Twitter or TikTok, right? Yes, I'm not a big fan of Web3, but it's interesting how it unravels, how, how it unfolds. We'll see what, where this will lead us to. Yeah, and a part of synonym is a slash tag. Um, um, so slash tag is basically uh, some a bit more formal definition of the protocol of how I want to uh, show my identities, my accounts, and my data to other people. So it has Contacts. Last time I checked, it had only contacts and and kind of like identities. If I'm not mistaken. No, it, it it was called accounts. But I'm gonna write identities. Uh, is 
account tonight and contact Alay sites and other people who could have shared some information. Say again? Are they, does that refer to sites and people that you would have shared information with? Yes. So that's how is, this, how is the um, protocol different from Moon and Taylor that you described here to how the guys uh, at, at Stripe are doing? How is how is Moon and Taylor different from what? Like, how, like the guys, what are the Jack Mallers and Stripe doing stuff in El Salvador and mm -hmm. Argentina? Are they using the same kind of protocol as this? Are they doing something different? They 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 do absolutely different stuff. So the way, if I got it correctly, the way Stripe works. So there's USA. There is Salvador. So uh, USA people, um, if they move BTC, it doesn't leave. Uh, they move from BTC to USD. It doesn't leave the country. Instead, on this side of the border, uh, uh, someone pays with USD at the receiver, and BTC is used as the transport layer. So there is no lightning, there is no tokens involved in Strike. With Tether itself, it wants KYC. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Tether their KYC anyway, aren't they? With what? Tether. Don't Tether have KYC? They have no KYC. They... Uh, I don't think they have KYC. I thought if you had to get off an exchange, they want, you, you need to have KYC. But that's, that's, uh, that's for exchange. So, exchange. so Tether doesn't care. Like, I can run a, sh a really shitty exchange and then require a KYC, and I would send everyone without their tethers without KYC. So if I got it correctly, this is how Strike works. That, that central point where it's moving from USA to Salvador, that is, isn't that over lightning? I heard it was lightning. It can be lightning, it can be BTC. It can be, it, it, it can be pigeons with golden coins, doesn't matter, because the real USD, uh, the real USD doesn't leave USA. Uh, instead, people inside of Salvador are paid with USD by someone from inside of Salvador. So this is how money moving services work these days. Um, so that, that's, <laughs> that was simply, well, that's, that's kind of what Abra. It's all what? Abra. Yes, it's, you know Abra? What's everyone already you know Abra? Abra. Like Opera Browser. No, A-B-R-A. No. They were going to use Bitcoin basically for remittances, weren't they? More or less in that kind of... I remember back in 2014 and they keep doing saying that since then, but I don't know. So the idea was basically someone would send funds of you know, and then they meet someone, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. This is the, this is actually quite old idea. So have you ever heard of TransferWise? Yeah. They they rebranded to Wise. So they do the same thing. The way they keep the costs low is that no, if you're sending pounds over the border, uh, no real pounds leave the country because they pay someone from inside the country and the destination country, someone pays the destination. So no real funds movement between the border across the border happens. This is how WISE works. This is how they keep their uh, fees really low. The idea is even older than that. Right? It's called Hawala or something, right? I mean, what's the problem? Yeah, but it's, yeah, but they, they, it's the same concept. Same concept. And I think Western Union did the same like two hundred years ago, right? So, you, so you just call. They, 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 they still charge people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Western Union, I think they were the same. So someone calls someone. Far away and says, "Look, you have to pay. You have to pay this guy this much." Uh, I will, I'll say that so I've heard Jack say he has admitted that somewhere in the protocol there is tether for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe instead of BTC you can move tether, like, but it doesn't matter that still USD doesn't leave USA and USD is paid in is paid in Salvador. Maybe it's just that instead of holding USD in their app, they're holding USDT, and one way for that to move it to your bank account. Is that's what so that way they don't have to... Well, I'm not a fan of Strike because because Strike is kind of a really centralized entity. Yeah. Weren't they, they, so the other, I thought they used DRC20 Strike to begin with when they do like kind of, um, so they're doing something somewhere else at the moment. And there was some, I don't know, it did, it, someone picked up on something about them using ERC20 and they did, oh no, it's just for the um, prototype. Well, anyway, there's no tokens involved, Lightning tokens in Strike. Anyone wants to add something? I don't know, maybe someone's, someone here is, uh, knows more ab about the synonym than I do. Please share. Okay, then let's move on. 
So next thing on my list is RGB. Now, RGB is a really interesting concept. So originally the synonym was, was, was supposed to run on RGB, but there were problems with RGB. So John decided to move from RGB and do this thing with, with Tether and tokens on Tether. So RGB is a, a kind of like architecture to run uh, smart contracts on BTC completely off chain uh, and reimagine smart contracts. So the way smart contracts work on Ethereum uh, is that Buterian said that we're gonna host all the source code on the blockchain. Actually, I was reading Buterian's blog posts from back in the day, I don't know, 2014 maybe. Uh, he actually, at the time he was, he, st he hasn't invented Ethereum yet, but he was writing blog posts about how Bitcoin works. And this is how I learned how Bitcoin works from his blog post actually in Python. Uh, and you kind of, you kind of can feel how this guy writes like, oh, this is where you put the Bitcoin script. And you see this idea sparkles in his mind that what if we'll put a whole Turing complete program inside of this, uh, Bitcoin script. So imagine this is Bitcoin transaction, right? So there are outputs and this is, and there is a Bitcoin script, which is not Turing complete. And this is where this guy thought, maybe we can put the whole program, really working program in, in this output. He came with this idea to Bitcoin core guys and they turned him down because this not even doesn't scale. It, it doesn't scale squared because uh, eventually a shitload of programs will migrate to this if it's successful, will migrate and will host their uh, source code on the blockchain. Uh, on top of uh, electric curve uh, verification that will add execution of the scripts on each block, well, this, this won't fly. And this is what we're seeing with Ethereum when it's, it's so big and it's so hard to run the node. Uh, so I think the block time for Ethereum like 17 seconds. There are blocks that takes like minutes to, to calculate, to process all scripts inside the block, like longer than a block time. This is ridiculous. Is that happening today, like minutes of verification? Maybe not with the lightest blocks, but still you can install the uh, Ethereum client and, you, and it will choke on some couple of years back data. You'll see like one block gets processed for minutes. There's some specific attacks, but I can't remember which year. I don't know. It was maybe really great transactions that just took ages. Uh, this is what happens. I mean, like, does, does basically block solved and it's stored until some computation time? What, what goes on? Yeah, it's all fun. We might even put it back to the block that was correct, and then all the other transactions would go back. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's this code that's causing the. The problem, is, the problem, the problem is, if it takes too long to verify a block, it gives an unfair advantage to the first discoverer. It, 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 tends, it leads to centralization where you. Like because you're sort of you're the first to learn the outcome, you can then start building the next block. Right. Whereas other people have to wait and they're still verifying the previous one. It, it leads to a kind of yeah, that's a very vague way of life. Well, imagine imagine you're writing shit code in your life and you're putting this shit code forever and ever in some block. This is ridiculous, right? So uh, Satoshi didn't put your incomplete language inside Bitcoin script, not because he was dumb. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm too dumb to put normal script in Bitcoin script. It was because he anticipated that people will be smart asses and will try to take advantage of your incomplete stuff in the blockchain. That's why he didn't do it. Uh, and that's why Bitcoin core guys turned down Vitalik when he came to them uh, with this idea. They said it's, it won't scale. But he went ahead anyway and created Ethereum. And now we have that, uh, you have a smart contract, you create a bytecode of this smart, co smart contract, you mine it in a transaction. So you have a transaction with this bytecode, bytecode. Uh, once it's mined, it gets an address. Now anyone can reference to this smart contract and provide some data. Uh, some data uh, and do some computations and uh, and um, alter the state on the on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, something happens here. Uh, yeah, so this is how it works. So you you keep a lot of code on the blockchain. Uh, each call of this code is another transaction that gets mined. 
and it mutates this global state and the global state is visible to everyone uh, and and smart contract is visible to everyone everyone can see everything well can, can i just sorry if, i know yeah. i just i just really want to correct what i said earlier and make it a bit more clear because the thing is like the problem with having a script which is in quotes turing complete is not that you can have infinitely long series of computations because you can impose a cost per per step and that's what they're doing here they don't let let it be an infinitely long program that just goes on forever the problem is that let's say it does take quite a while like a minute or two the problem is i can pre-compute a block before everyone else knows about it and then publish it to the network and then everyone else has got this massive disadvantage because I'm, I'm, I'm two, three, four minutes ahead of everyone in the block. And that's what leads to that centralization I was trying to. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Yeah, so a bit... uh, okay, so this concept scales very bad. So, so the, the current consensus on the Ethereum world is that let's create a side chain. Uh, actually, they have several side chains, and those cha side chains act as batching for transactions, uh, which is basically roll ups. So, roll up is a sidechain where you batch several transactions into some one transaction. Uh, so the way they do, it, they do it now is that they have zero knowledge uh, rollups and optimistic rollups. So zero knowledge rollups still publish cryptographic proofs that the, the computation happened. Um, and optimistic rollups, uh, they don't publish anything. They just hope that everything is correct and that some kind, some kind of validator later will catch the cheater and will punish the cheater. That's how it works. That's why optimistic rollups are more favorable in the Ethereum community because they can process even more because they don't, do, they don't do shit. They do something in zero knowledge rollups, but not in optimistic rollups. I think this about the optimistic one is that if there is a dispute and somebody says, oh, there was a fraud, like one of those thousand transactions that was actually fraudulent, it means that you have to wait some time to you have to wait to, for a fraud proof to get published. So mm -hmm. that means that if you want to take your money off this optimistic thing, it takes ages, right? It takes a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last time I read, it was one week. So, so if you have a dispute on optimistic rollups, there is a one week dispute. So you don't have a f finality of a transaction for a week, right? In Bitcoin, you have it in six blocks in one hour. So what yeah. happens to the plasma originally? That's going to be the thing, right? Yes. I, th I think Plasma was, uh, was it a roll-up? I, I thought Plasma was a sidechain technology, no? I thought it was like their lightning, the smart contract. Yeah, yeah. Plasma was like, it's also like a great yeah. hope, you know, that, that would change everything. Change and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last time I read in Plasma it is, was the fact that it died. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so RGB is a totally different concept from this. So RGB says, well, okay, guys, look, we have a contract. We don't have to keep this contract public. So if I'm buying a car, it's a contract between me and a seller of the car. We don't have to make it worldwide available. So the contract is between me and the seller of the car. So it, it utilizes concepts of um, client-side validation. It, it utilizes concept of single-use seals which is totally new concept in cryptographic world. And directed icyclic graphs. Now, let's imagine I'm creating a contract to issue tokens and I want to award some tokens with someone. So I create a, uh, a definition of the token, which is called schema in a world of RGB. Um, with this schema, I, sh I, I share this schema on a client side. I don't commit this schema anywhere. I share this schema with my peer who I uh, send some tokens, and this is going to be a mutation of a state. So I'm sharing only a state with my peer. Uh, and this peer has it only on client side. He sees that uh, this is a mutation of a state. This is the source of the state. There are cryptographic proofs that this has happened. This was signed by my friend's public key, uh, it happened. And we don't have to commit to the blockchain. Now this guy, well, I, I can send some tokens again and mutate a state. And this guy can send it somewhere else. So we, we end up with the graph. We end up with directed acyclic graph. It's directed because it flows in one direction, so I can sh send tokens only in this direction. It's acyclic because you cannot uh, make some crazy loop and go back, and it's a graph, so it's a DAG. 
and it employs client-side validation. So every time I mutate a state, I share the new state with, uh, with my peer who I'm sending tokens to. So this is schema, schema. And this is how we keep it off chain. Like we don't commit anything to blockchain. Well, there is a problem here with double spends. So how do I prove that there is no double spend here? So this is where we employ uh, single use seals and some other uh, cryptographic magic, uh, which is newly invented for RGB. So single use seals is the new concept is in uh, cryptography. Uh, it was invented by Peter Todd, I think. Um, so I think if we boil down single use seals, it will be in the end, if you can take a private key, sign something and prove to someone that you signed with this private key only once. So if I'm taking a message and I'm signing it with my private key and I give you this message, and then I sign something with the same private key and give it to you, can I prove that, that uh, I didn't do this? So in, in, in purely cryptographic terms, it's impossible because I can take my private key and sign as many messages as I want. So in pure cryptographic and pure mathematics, this is impossible. So single use seals relies on something else to publish, to publish cryptographic stuff so other people can verify. And this is, I think, the weak spot in, in this concept because you have to have a storage to publish uh, single use seals and that, this, that there were no double spends. You know, we have a whole proof of work, huge machine to prevent double spends in Bitcoin. And here we say, oh, we'll just use single use seals and it's sorted, you know, and we're done. We're, we're cool. Uh, so this is a big spot. I think in the early concepts, they were supposed to use some IPFS or some distributed file storage for single use seals. But now I think, I don't know what they're doing. Maybe, I don't know. But, but, uh, hyper, they don't use hypercore. Last time I checked, there's no mention of hypercore in RGB. Um, what you were saying earlier, like it's, in, it's like impossible mathematically, it's kind of true, right? But there, there is a, like exactly that rule because if if you have a, a signature scheme by which, like a single use signature scheme by which, if you publish a second signature on the same key, you're, you're the private key. Such signature schemes exist, and yeah. that, that could yeah. conceivably, in a half kind of way, solve that problem. Yeah, but Probably. yeah, but but since we use client side validation we're not sharing it to anyone. So like yeah. you receive tokens, this is a transaction for your eyes only. So you have to have some kind of a storage for everyone so everyone can see it. Yeah, so... Until we explain your effects and then public verifying, right? So mm -hmm. you've got, it's another channel you're closing at some point, but it's just got This is, you said, so this is happening off chain, right? Yeah. right. But at some point you want to sum up everything they, they, don't, they don't need it. So imagine you have a schema for a token and it's just, it's a shit token. Like it's not related to Bitcoin in any way. So you don't need to publish it to blockchain. Well, they still, they still use, uh, I think currently RGB is at the stage where you need to publish your single use seals or whatever to blockchain. So you're not publishing the whole transaction. You're only publishing some some uh, cryptographic byproducts of, of the transaction happened here and here and here. So alone this data is not enough for anything. It's just, it's just data, but uh, in a combination of client uh, site validation and this data, like I issued some token on a schema, I mutated the state to move tokens to my friends here and he moved it here and here. Uh, in combination, it works. Which is schema? Why is that exactly? Because it's not clear to me. So the schema is whatever you want it to be. So uh, right now I think they... Just how many restrictions you want to put there pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it can be a token, it can be an NFT or something else. So they're working on... Uh, RGB guys are working on different schemas. Uh, they, in fact, they, they created um, RGB... To zero, so they call their token schemas RGB to zero is a relation to RC to zero uh, tokens on Ethereum. Can you give it like definitions, you know, like name your token, how many of their issues, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know, list right. of the yeah, and of course we have uh, uh, bullet proofs and Pedersen commitments here. So uh, at the point of uh, moving tokens, we don't see uh, amounts. So it's it's kind of 
It's more private than regular tokens. So if I'm this guy, if I'm this guy, all, all, what I need to get is only get client data from here, partially from here and this schema, and I can validate that this happened and, the, and I, I indeed received those tokens. And if I look into Bitcoin blockchain, I can also make sure that no double spends happened. And boom, you have smart contracts on uh, Bitcoin, uh, but without this massive uh, computation on Ethereum. Like you have to, you know, a lot of stuff. Well, it's, it's a bit more complex here than, than I just said. They also, uh, because it's not very simple transfer, it might not be a very simple transfer. It might be a very complex state mutation. So they created... Uh, can you explain like, the mutation? Can you just walk through a very dumb example, like what a mutation would be? That for me is not really clear. So basic mutation is that I had 10 tokens uh, and now I changed it and now I have eight and this guy has two. Oh, I see. Yeah, so uh, for more complex... So every time you update what's between you, I mean, that's a different mutation. Right? Yeah, yeah, so kind of different, different state and this is the graph of states. Oh, uh, but because they want something more complex, they created the uh, uh, virtual machine kind of like Ethereum virtual machine, but not the same. They called it AluVM. I think it's arithmetic logic something, virtual machine. Uh, and this virtual machine is gonna process these state mutations. Okay, so the problem with RGB is that it became a very big, very complex concept. So it's in development for several years and we don't see it getting into production very soon. People just work on it and work on it. So right now, and I, I don't think they have enough manpower. I think it's Max Arlovsky and a couple of guys more that's working on it. So right now they have AluVM, which is on, in its infancy. They created, uh, they want to put this on Lightning as well. So they created uh, a brand new Lightning node. I forgot the name. Lightning node. They create, they're creating a, a wallet that can handle all of this, that, which is called My Citadel. And the scope of work is really big, like a lot of stuff to do to make it fly. That's why John from Cinnamon, he was relying on this in, initially, but in the end he decided that this is not getting into production anytime soon. So we need to switch to something more realistic, something we can deliver. That's why he switched to tokens on OmniLayer, so it apparently it's easier to put uh, uh, Omni tokens inside of Lightning than make this fly. And that's RGB, ladies and gentlemen. And what did you specifically like about this? Just the, uh, the, the, the seal things? What, did you, what made you present this one? Well, the whole concept is very cool. Like uh, you have um, smart contracts that don't have to touch uh, blockchain. They don't have a massive footprint. So this schema is not committed to blockchain. In Ethereum, you would take your big smart contract, compile it into bytecode, put it inside a transaction and mine it. And it's in block, in the blockchain forever and ever. And every state mutation in Ethereum, so everyone can see this in Ethereum, everyone can see this smart contract, everyone can interact with it, everyone can read it and know what, what was it about. But in reality, if I want a smart contract, I want it between me and you. No one else should be involved, right? It's because because it's between me and you. And the people involved can see their chain of relevance, as it were, wherever they were back. Yeah, yeah. People, only people involved. So, and every state mutation is not a, a huge transaction because in Ethereum, you take uh, um, arguments for a method that was mined in blockchain, you put it again in a transaction, you mine it, and then the global state mutated in Ethereum. So it takes a lot of data and a lot of computations. In RGB, you take it completely off blockchain. You don't use blockchain, only for some, uh, for some um, validations that no double spends happened, which is quite tiny. Like you can use op returns for that, which is like 40 bytes per transaction. When, it, when in Ethereum, like, I don't know, each transaction just to mutate token state, I don't know how much is that, it's a lot. Because obviously they're moving through the state, right? So, so they're yeah. moving through the state, so they won't have the... In Ethereum? Yeah. I think they're moving to proof of stake, but it's unrelated. They're still going to have contracts uh, compiled to bytecode, committed to somewhere, uh, and each node will have to, uh, to 
uh, recomputate each state's mutation in Ethereum. So proof of stake is not even a solution here. Is the idea with RGB can any one person then eventually like cash out without affecting everyone else's stake in this tree? And then so so like if if I'm doing sorry? Same person. Yes, yeah, so it's like same person got got two Bitcoin. Would they be able to then record that on the blockchain and then sort of be able to There's no collateral involved. There's no collateral. So I create a schema, there's no collateral involved. There's no Bitcoin involved. But the car's been sold, sold it for two by the token. Is how does he then sort of take the two you know, Whereas it never it never leaves this thing. It yeah. it passes on to the back. Yeah. The the token never leaves the RGB. It's only using Bitcoin as a kind of anchor for cryptographic proof. Ultimately they're trying to achieve cryptographically provable token, not not a derivative of Bitcoin. Yeah, and I forgot about about that. That so on top of that, they're working on the Bitfrost, not not Bit Bfrost, Bfrost, which is uh, which is going to be a protocol for DEXs on top of RGB. Uh, this is where you'll be able to sw to swap your RGB tokens to other RGB tokens, or I don't know Bitcoin, or use atomic swaps to some other coins and other blockchains. Well, the point is that the whole scope of the, the of the project is huge, huge. So we don't see when it will be in production. Can I just ask again about the, the tricky point, the single use seals point? Because I just refresh my memory looking at Pete Todd's old blog post, and he was saying that yeah, you, you how are you going to know that this seal hasn't been used somewhere else? That's the fundamental problem. Yeah, you've got a seal, you can show the signature and move it to a new thing, but you need to know there hasn't been another signature. And he was saying he has this thing called a proof of publication ledger, and his idea was that there'd be a Separate ledgers, so it sort of hooks into the Bitcoin blockchain. So, 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 the proof of, so I think the proof of publication layer is just a general concept, which is which could be IPFS or in this case blockchain, no, Bitcoin blockchain. Using IPFS, I see. So I I, it was, I think it was early on. I think you can find even still in, in documentation because it wasn't updated. But I think they decided not to do it and just use uh, regular Bitcoin transactions using op return. As a, as a proof of publication. They have to kind of like batch them, right? Because you can't obviously do it. They'll have to be like, do you know what I mean? Each individual seal, there might be millions of them, you can't pop return all of them. So. Well, I think that's work in progress. That's why, uh, that, 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 that's why it's, it's still not in, in production. Yeah, single use seals is kind of complex concept. I don't completely understand. I, I'm not even sure that each state mutation has single use seals. I think it's some different cryptography. Single use seals definitely used at the schema issue, issuing that you uh, you issue a single use you issue a schema, you you put a cryptographic proof on the blockchain in a form of single use seal. I don't know why. And and here is some different magic, some different cryptographic magic. I don't really understand. So you can't pay out onto the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. like once you're in this network, that's super. No pegging out. Well, you start in that network as well. Not once you're into it, you start in it. The token is created in that. So the token goes into the blockchain. I suppose you can always convert outside of the blockchain. Yeah. Trusted, right? You use atomic swaps, maybe. Yeah. Or DEX, like you said. Or DEX, yeah. Atomic swaps. Yeah. And and DEX, I think that's another concept which is currently explored by other blockchains, by altcoins. So it's a concept that you don't have a, a block of transactions, a concept of state mutations and uh, creating a graph of everything. I don't know how successful it is in altcoin world. I have to research it. Was it uh, on this, do you have a level of confidence? Like how, you know, do you see a feasible, it's being feasible? Or? Well, Ethereum still comes up this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a very interesting concept, but I don't see it flying in this year, to be honest. Neither. Yeah, it's not true. All the games for next year are kind of far away. Say again? I think all the games for at least next year. Same format, next year. Yeah. You think it's going to go this year? Yeah, I think so. It's in my head that this year is going to take place. But you also sound very confident about it, I see you're talking. No, I just have a bad memory, not perfection. Okay. I'm sure there's some stuff. There's in there somewhere. They released some stuff. They released, uh, I think, bit of my Citadel. They released bit of Lightning implementation, brand new Lightning implementation based on Rust. So they're releasing something. They're working, 
But will this whole concept be viable this year, by the end of this year? I don't know. So if, I, if I'd had to bet, I would bet on, uh, what's that? Yeah, I would bet on Cinnamon. Yeah. Well, I think that's all I wanted to tell you guys for today. What you can tell us about LSPs, I wanted to hear about LSPs. <laughs> uh, or is that not in? Well, uh, well, yeah, actually LSP is uh, one of the concepts of, of uh, synonym was a block tank. Well, where did I put it? Uh, let's put it here, block tank. So the idea was is that once they created tokens on Lightning Network, on OmniLayer, on OmniBolt, uh, it takes a lot of friction to make those tokens fly. It's not like in Ethereum, you create a smart contract and everyone can use those tokens. In Lightning, you have to supply um, liquidity for your own tokens. So if you create a token on OmniLayer, you have to supply liquidity. And block tank is their, is their own uh, LSP, which is going to supply liquidity for USDT. So say you want to uh, participate in a, Lightning, in a USDT tokens on Lightning Network. So what you do, uh, well, you announce it and block tank will create a channel to you uh, with, uh, so you'll get incoming liquidity in USDT on Omnibolt protocol on, on Lightning. Does that make sense? So block tank. So other people that will want to issue tokens on uh, Omnibolt, they will have to do the same. So if I want to create my Doge token on Omnibolt, I will have to maintain my own LSP, which is supposedly going to be a block tank, open source block tank. Uh, and I'm going to open channels to other people who want to receive Doge token on Omnibolt layer two. Uh, what else about LSP? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't thought about it much. It's just uh, I'm not a fan of LSP concept because, like, uh, lightning, se lightning service provider, right? Like you're supposed to open channels to everyone, and you're aiming to make fees route into everyone. So this leads to centralization. Um, you have to commit a lot of funds to those channels. Um, and you don't even know if you're and, and you're spending funds to open the channel. So th this could be a lot of money. I don't think it's worth it. So you're opening a channel. So you spend fees on opening channel. You're committing capital to a channel, which is dead weight now. And you hope to earn fee routing fees. So how much could it be? Like uh, I remember uh, channel opening fees were like 15 bucks when, it, when the blockchain was clocked. Can I make my 15 bucks back back by fees by routing fees in several years? I'm not sure. And I committed capital. Like if I locked one Bitcoin to a customer, if I get thousand customers per day. Do I commit 1,000 Bitcoins per day? That's a shitload of money. So I'm not a fan of LSP concept, but I don't know a solution around it at the moment. The comparison to make is with a custodial service, right? So like, so I mean, if an LSP is at least better than a custodial service because at least there's a channel being allocated to a specific person. Mm -hmm. But a custodial service, the user never has a channel. And the custodian is yeah. the user of the lightning spin. So I suppose this is like, obviously, I agree with you, like it's gonna lead to centralization if everyone uses it. But perhaps it's better than the custodian. Yeah, so I don't know. If Blue Wallet would have to act as LSP with on board thousand people per day, like we would have to commit a lot of capital to channels. And I don't think we would ever make it back. Maybe so, once someone's got a channel with an LSP, perhaps that's like a stepping stone to operating the channel themselves. Maybe the, the channel that the LSP is operating for that customer, such user, can be transitioned to a channel that the user then operates once the user understands what they're to do. I'm sure the user is able to use it in the end. Hmm? I'm sure the user, the user has to 
Yeah, but but that uh, starts sounding like an economy, you know, like you have acquisition cost, you have running cost. So if you if you run an open source, like okay, fuck fuck the cost. But if you run it as a business, you have acquisition cost, running cost, uh, marketing cost, and will it uh, will the economy like converge to a point of being profitable? I don't see it being. I don't see it converging to the point of being profitable. Uh, like, as I said, opening fees could be 15 bucks per channel per user. And this is a lot of money to pay for, for onboarding a user who, who you don't even know is going to use the app. Maybe he just opened the app and you're going to close it and delete it. Yeah. Yeah, open channels, you know, they have closing batches of those. It's like, there's just not used. Or you have bad channels and they're like, and then you get your own load. It's not slash, but ratings drop because yeah. people yeah. aren't using it. It's like, well, how am I supposed to be responsible if other people are using it but the liquidity is still there? Mm -hmm. I think the management system of how they're defining the value of channels is important on it. They break all of this stuff. Yeah, and my L&D, my production L&D has problems maintaining 100 channels on four cores. Uh, how, how I'm gonna add 1,000 more channels per day? Do I need to run a DevOps team? <laughs> Uh, CPU, mostly CPU. Well, it, it you know it it works fine, and then it just chokes like for five minutes. It just you see CPU, uh, hundred uh, percent. Then then it's fine again. Yeah, so I don't see it working. Have you tried Lightning at all? No, 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 it's not realistic for you because of the way you use APIs. Everyone, in the, everyone in the industry seems to mainly mainly just use LND for, mm -hmm. for like. Industry application, let's say. Yeah, L&D is popular. No, so, so C Lightning could be could be a solution. Maybe they're not CPU bound. I haven't tried it yet. Ross Lightning, he's pretty high on board. He, so yeah. Ross Lightning, it's quite question. I'm not sure. It's literally talking about anything. Awesome. What's the question? The, the Ross implementation with the RGB guy. How do you care? Uh, there, so um, RGB guys use different Ross Lightning implementation. They write it from scratch. Yeah, yeah. So I've tried L LDK. Uh, yeah. LDK is pretty good. Uh, no, should, we, should we just like officially say right now this is like question period, right? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we've got, got, we've got, I we've got have a lot of LDK and, and you know, we've got one of the main like implementers of real world lightning usage here, so this is your chance to ask him. Uh, any questions you have about lightning, basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, all right. If we don't have any more questions, uh, Tracy, you want to go and tell everyone about Beef Refill? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the opportunity for me to share a bit refill again. <laughs> and Bit Refill is a platform that allows you to buy gift cards using like Bitcoin and Lightning and other shit coins as well. <laughs> that you can buy like gift cards of like Amazon and uh, like Uber, Tesco and so on. Yeah. Using and we with with, with oh, no QIC uh, mm -hmm. under two thousand dollars per day, yeah. So that's the best cuts. And more importantly, the first round of drinks is on Dana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot this one. Yeah, so all the drinks are on us. Oh, no, no one, 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 one drink. One drink. <laughs> okay. That's it. Good stuff. All right, cool. That's it. Thank you. Good. Thanks.